right. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Wow. Good. All right. All right. Yes. Okay. So let's get started. We have to, whoops, share the screen. And then we can talk about um, mediumship and ghost hunting. It's mostly going to be mediumship, uh, but we can chit chat about ghost hunting um, using the materials we've learned. Uh, yes, uh, not yesterday, but um, for our previous lecture, as well as what we will uh, be learning today. Once my incredibly slow computer starts the slideshow. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, I mean, I, it's funny. I, I, there are, there are, um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can absolutely, uh, one of the ideas, uh, so first of all, Alicia, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that, um, many, um, professional ghost hunters all it's kind of like a second job. Uh, right. And of course, my paradigmatic example of that is the show Ghost Hunters, where I, I think, as I mentioned before, and as you'll uh, no doubt know, uh, their their day job is plumbing. Um, so I guess they're kind of like the Super Mario Brothers of the paranormal because they're plumbers. And then they get out of their plumbing van and hop into their ghost hunting van and they go hunting for the ghosts. So... Um, I don't know if there are a lot of people who do it. I mean, they they did. They stopped being plumbers. They actually became honorary plumbers for life um, somehow. Uh, because, uh, they retired from plumbing and went full-time ghost hunting for the television show. But beyond that, I think most people have, uh, most people, it's like a hobby or they have a second, like a primary source of income, right? Um, and yeah, Ben, you can absolutely watch an episode uh, that would be an interesting thing to do for a critical response. If you watched an episode, reviewed it, and critiqued it, um, sort of put your skeptical goggles on and examine an episode of Ghost Hunters or or anything, really, any kind of paranormal media, uh, that would be pretty neat. That would be a cool thing to do for a critical response. So everybody, if you're thinking of something to do or trying to think of something to do for your second critical response, that is something you might want to um, consider. Um, critiquing some kind of uh, media. Could be ghost hunters, could be um, a show about mediums, ancient aliens, ancient apocalypse. The, the list goes on, right? Well, the same way you'd engage with uh, uh, anything, really, um, you would want to critically evaluate the claims that are being made. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of these are not going to meet the standard of academic scholarship, these television shows, I mean, but that doesn't stop academics from talking about them, right? That So that, that would be my advice, Taylor. Um, you can treat it like you're treating anything else you're talking about, really. And then, um, you know, put those skeptical goggles on and just critically evaluate it, you know? All right. So just recall, before we get into this today, metaphysical naturalism, right? We reviewed some of this stuff before, so I won't, I won't spend too much time on it today. But remember last time and, and one of the lectures before that, we've got We've got um, materialism or more, more modernly physicalism, um, really two names for the same thing. And these are each kinds of substance monism, which are metaphysical theories that say that only the physical or what is natural exists. So no supernatural anything, really. And this is reflected by a view called metaphysical naturalism. I think most metaphysical naturalists would be physicalists. This is a theory about what kinds of things exist, right? What reality is like. Um, and we can contrast substance 
monism with substance dualism, particularly the dualism of Rene Descartes. Remember, we've got um, two different substances here in order to explain how the human being works. We have matter, which is extended substance. So it takes up space, it has mass, it can uh, you know, causally interact with other uh, you know, bodies as Descartes called them. And then there's mind, which is essentially like your soul, right? Uh, thinking substance, res cogitans. It is non-physical. It thinks. It does not take up space. It is not extended. It has no mass. And it explains everything mental um, about the human being. Not just thought and perception and conscious experience, but reason, morality, free will, um, so on. Was there an alternate third name for this? For um for uh oh dualism well sometimes called substance dualism um i don't know what the alternate name would be cartesian dualism i suppose is what some people call it oh uh sydney go ahead yeah the way people like think like crystals have powers and stuff um would that be connected to substance dualism it could be it could be. Um, I you would really have to ask the person uh, who's who's making the claim, right? I think some people would claim that crystals just have energies, if you like, that are uh, part of the natural world that scientists don't understand yet, and others might claim that crystals' energies are maybe a bit more like the soul in the substance dualist conception of the soul. Um, of course, one thing that I, that I, I, I can't emphasize enough is that energy is like for a metaphysical naturalist or, or a substance monist, uh, a naturalist or a physicalist energy is physical. It's part of the physical world. Right. Uh, so go ahead again, Sydney. Yeah. Like the reason that it makes me think of it is because I was once when I was in Hawaii, I was in like this crystal store and this girl walks in and she was like, do you have anything that'll protect me while I'm driving? And I was like being a good driver. But the, <laughs> the idea that, yeah, like a crystal could protect you from getting in a car crash kind of thing. That is, yeah, I'm not really sure what to do with that. Right. Um, I, uh, it certainly sounds as that as though th that's not a naturalistic way of thinking about crystals, right? Uh, so I don't know if it's necessarily dualism, but it's definitely not naturalism, right? Um, so I, I I know that's not a very clear answer, so I apologize for that, but I hope it it it's a little bit clear. Um, yeah, Conrad, this is a good point. I didn't want to forget to come back to this. Yeah, naturalism is self-correcting. Um, uh, uh, <coughs> that's what science is about, right? And yeah, of course, some rocks have powers in, in, the, in the physical sense, right? Um, yeah, like Johnny says, with, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. It has power. It has, it has uh, radioactivity. And that radioactivity is um, little particles that are shooting off uh, because perhaps the isotope of uranium that you've got is unstable and it wants to decay into something that is stable, right? All uranium does this, but I think some of it is more unstable than others, right? Some of it is more reactive, more fissile, we say. So uh, yeah, you're right. Those are definitely still physical things. We could talk about that in, with our everyday vernacular with like you know referring to it as power or energy but it's it's still part of the physical and that's what i mean um when i say that energy yeah conrad okay yeah so we're all on the same page about that that's good yeah i agree conrad yeah like if um if uh if crystals had powers um i mean scientists would be all over that and that's what what my point about um piezoelectricity was um, before like you can generate electrical signals by um you know delivering some kind of kinetic uh kinetic energy you can turn kinetic energy into electrical energy using crystals it's called piezo piezoelectricity right so 
But that doesn't mean that crystals will make you a better driver, of course. It's not that kind of energy. It's energy for a physicalist. So you can make um, you can make a really cool electric acoustic pickup uh, for an electric guitar with crystals, like I mentioned before, right? But you cannot heal yourself or drive a car better with crystals, right? Um, yeah. Okay, that's a good point. It could be a psychological thing. Yeah, like um, maybe um, maybe it's like a charm. Yeah, psychological. Yeah, so it's it could be it could be like a superstition rather than a um uh, a, a theory about how a part of a theory about how reality is. So that's a that's also a good point. So yeah, uh, uh, that's that's matter and mind for the substance dualist. And remember, I know we haven't read Descartes in this class. Some of you are in my other class where we did look a little bit more closely at Descartes. Um, but if you're, if you're really worried about missing any of these details, these Cartesian details, I do, um, let's see, do I have Minds and Machines on my YouTube channel? I might. I'm sure I've got a lecture on Descartes on my YouTube channel somewhere, if you, if you want to look that up. Um, yeah, people, people have lots of reasons why they believe different things. I bet if we were to poll people who believed in, say, crystal power, we would get a lot of different answers about why, like what exactly it is they believe about them and why, right? So, okay, so Cartesian dualism, substance dualism is quite old um, in the sense that mind-body dualism is quite old. Um, it actually goes all the way back to Plato. Um, Plato um, believed that the rational soul was um, sort of divine and imperishable and perfect. And it could survive the death of the body. And the body, of course, is made of matter and corrupt and will eventually die and decay, right? And it probably goes back way beyond that because people seem to be, people seem to have this folk notion of dualism. We just sign, sort of naturally treat the mind and the body um, as different kinds of things, right? Unlike Plato, Descartes also believed the... Um, the soul could survive death uh as uh, a point of departure um you know plato actually believes the soul has three parts uh it has the rational part which is basically your intellect right your mind uh then you have your passionate soul which is uh passionate or spirited soul which is your emotional center right um yeah yeah more like yeah exactly why why yeah we're doing uh yeah yeah uh, uh blah, 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 blah. i'm getting distracted uh the passionate soul is the scene of the emotions and the appetitive soul is like your basic appetites and drives you know hunger thirst and so forth descartes gets rid of the last two Descartes says, well, um, we, we probably don't have a, an appetitive soul and a spirited soul. Um, at that point, people, people would have been talking about Aristotle's tripart tripartite soul, which is a bit different. And, the, and they were starting to abandon that around the time Descartes arrives on the scene. So Descartes is abandoning all manner of things Aristotelian. His idea of the soul, um, his theory of causality, um, uh, some things like entelechy, right? Uh, this is all kind of being gotten rid of at this point in history when Descartes has arrived on the scene. But Descartes, because he's a Jesuit, he's educated as a Jesuit, I should say, in the Jesuit tradition, which means he's kind of like a philosopher priest, right? Um, Jesuits are like um, Catholic scholars, Um so um so obviously he he wants to show somehow that uh the soul can survive death um he wants to show that 
this aspect of his religion is true. And he does that um, by arguing that the rational soul, the mind is an immaterial, unextended thinking substance. <laughs> oh, interesting. I didn't learn about this until, uh, well, until I started studying philosophy, which was actually not when I was young. I was not, I, I did, I didn't develop an interest in philosophy uh, or at least I didn't know I had an interest in philosophy until I was older. But I suppose I did have an interest in philosophy because I always loved um, Star Trek, uh, which, yes, is science fiction. But also every episode is like a, a thought. Uh, well, not every episode, but many episodes basically serve as philosophical thought experiments. Right. So, yeah. All right, what's everybody saying? Um, yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. Well, that James, that might fit with some people's intuitions about, about crystals. Um, perhaps they can absorb my negative energy, right? Like, I, I don't, I, I have to admit, like, I don't know the claims people make about crystals. Oh, I do have a friend that I could ask, though. Oh, I can't believe I haven't thought of this. I have a friend who doesn't believe in any of this crystal stuff. <laughs> but get this. She works at, like, uh, a crystal store. Uh, it's not just crystals. They sell crystals. They sell singing bowls. You know, it's like a new age store. Um, she works at one of those. Um and she knows what everything is supposed to be good for, but like, she doesn't actually believe it works, which is great. Um, yeah. So I guess, yeah, James, I guess that would be one big one now that I think about it, but I'll have to ask my friend. Um, but yeah, absorbing or radiating different energies, I guess, which, you know, makes sense. Uh, into even on Star Trek, you've got the dilithium crystals powering your warp core. Right. So yeah. Yeah, and fantasy, uh, Conrad, I know, uh, yeah, I don't know if you're talking about fantasy as well, but yeah. Yeah. Um, world building in a fictional setting, you can use crystals for um, to create a, a fictional world where crystals do have powers. That would be fine. Um, Hmm. Marks and fetishism, eh? That, that's that's that would have been a pretty interesting discussion. Um. Uh. Okay. So, what does all this have to do with ghosts? Um. Well, ghost. Obviously, the word ghost refers to the spirit of someone who has died. Um. And and just like Plato, all the way back in the day, was a dualist. There have been reports of ghost sightings you know, since at least the time of Plato and before, right? The oldest ghost stories go back to, um, go back to like Mesopotamia, right? So uh, as old as civilization, probably a lot older because we're sort of like natural, uh, like folk, folk dualists, right? Incidentally, the word ghost, the English word ghost, is cognate, that means of the same blood, with the German Geist. Uh, this means that these two words are descended from a common ancestor word. So at one point, um, back in the day, many centuries ago, uh, English and German did not exist. Um but there was a language called Proto-Germanic that would have been spoken in Europe um, by, uh, by the sorts of, uh, you know, tribal peoples that lived, at, uh, uh, that lived in the area at the time. Um, and before it eventually differentiated into all of the different Germanic languages, uh, you know, um, that we have today, like English and German and uh, uh, Dutch, um, all the Nordic ones, um, you know, those, those are the big ones. Um, before that happened, uh, there would have been just one word, like kind of like the distance, distant ancestor of the word ghost. 
And now um, the word ghost in English and the word Geist in German are like cousins, if you want to think about it, right? And in German, ghost uh, or Geist doesn't just mean the spirit of a dead person. It can also be in, uh, mind or just simply a spirit, not like a, um, a ghostly spirit, but a spirit like the spirit of the times, like a zeitgeist. You've probably heard this term zeitgeist. That means time spirit or spirit of the times. And it doesn't refer to a spirit in the sense, like in the sense of a being. It refers to spirit like the spirit, like, like Christmas spirit or something right like the way we use that word christmas spirit yeah yeah exactly zeitgeist um materialist philosophers uh physicalists um substance monists say that there is no soul there is no soul in the dualist sense at least there are functionalists who say um well, the soul is, um, it's not a, uh, it's not like a spirit that inhabits you. It, it, it just is the form and function of your living body. Um, this is how I read Aristotle. Aristotle's soul is, is not like Plato's. Aristotle has a tripartite soul, but it does not survive the death of the body. Um, ghost and phantom well phantom is uh uh yeah same thing but a phantom uh the word phantom i believe comes from uh greek uh if you go back far enough now greek is a um an indo-european language uh, so it's also distantly related, very much more distantly related to English than German is, for example. But yeah, phantom. Um, I mean, think of uh, the phantom of the opera, right? It's really a guy, but everybody thinks it's a ghost, right? So it's just a, another word from the same for the same thing. Um. Okay, so um, what was I saying? Right, Aristotle. Aristotle's soul doesn't survive the death of the body. In fact, for Aristotle, the soul is the form of an organized living body. So Aristotle's a bit like a functionalist in that what matters is what something does. And if, if something does things like, you know, um, uh, consumes food, grows and reproduces... Um, if it moves around and senses its environment, or if it has an intellect, well, that means all these things, all these things mean you have soul. You have a nutritive soul. If you're, um, if you're like a plant, you have a nutritive soul. Um, if you're an animal, you have a nutritive and sensitive soul. And if you're a human, you, you have those two plus the rational soul. Um, yeah. So, um, Gilbert Ryle famously remarked, there is no ghost in the machine. What does that mean? Well, that means that, well, he's saying, he's expressing his disagreement with Cartesian dualism. On Cartesian dualism, it sounds almost like there is a, uh, a machine sort of body. A uh, body, uh, Descartes was um, a mechanist when it came to the body. The body was like a machine made by god like a robot almost a, a, a flesh robot um but but we were we are ensouled with a rational soul which actually interacts uh with the body via the pineal gland which is a little gland in your brain um it, of course this isn't really what the pineal gland does but the re but descartes thought that the soul interacted with this little gland which pushed uh animal spirits through your nerves which are like this, it's like this kind of fluid. Um, and then that's what made your limbs move. And similarly, being affected by physical stuff outside, like touches like this, affects the animal spirits, which goes to the pineal gland and affects the soul. Ryle says, nonsense. There is no ghost in the machine. So in a sense, in a certain sense, questions about ghosts 
aren't really just um, interesting if you're a paranormal researcher or a parapsychologist. Um, in a sense, this should be interesting to you if you're interested in philosophy, because whether you believe in ghosts will tell you something about what you believe about um, the soul, metaphysically speaking, right? All of this sort of asking these questions of yourself will reveal what you think reality is like, essentially, is what I mean, right? And also, if we were to establish that ghosts were real, that could show that materialism is wrong. It could mean that our naturalistic view of the universe is wrong. Then again, maybe it'll show us that we don't understand the universe well enough yet. If it turned out that there were ghosts, like real actual spirits of deceased people, they couldn't actually be spirits in the supernatural sense if we wanted to study them scientifically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, we have to talk about this. Um, uh, well, Alicia, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Um, Plato's explanation of soulmates? Yeah, so essentially the story that I heard was, um, you know, Zeus grew like really, or like at first uh, humans originally had four arms, four legs, you know, like they were just like together. Yeah. But Zeus grew too jealous of their power and split them in half, condemning ev like everyone to find, you know, their matching soul. Yeah, basically that's the story, and it comes from it comes from his dialogue, the Symposium, which means the drinking party, and it's all about love. And basically, Socr in in this, the character Socrates and a bunch of other guys get together, get drunk, and talk about the nature of love. And it's Aristophanes, the comedian, who offers this story where um, people used to be kind of stuck together by the belly button, cartwheeling around. Um, you know, it, it's supposed to be kind of funny. That's why Aristophanes is the one telling the story. And yeah, as you say, um, Zeus was threatened, so he split everybody apart, right? Um, that is uh, That is where the idea of a soulmate comes from um yeah it's a, it's an interesting account um i actually had a friend uh, she got married and wanted me to read that at her wedding and i did um uh it was but it's but it was weird uh because i knew like but it's supposed to be a joke like it, it's aristophanes it's not plato saying this as plato it's the character aristophanes saying this but whatever i made my friend happy um so uh yeah that's uh let's get back to this there's a lot of ways we can talk about ghosts too um in a course like this uh, we could talk about ghost hunting and i want to talk a little bit about ghost hunting at the end or we could talk about other weird phenomena like hauntings um the poltergeist which means noisy ghost so the sort of uh haunting where people claim that things are flying off the walls and doors are opening and closing on their own and you know weird stuff is happening things are being thrown around there's loud noises that is a poltergeist a noisy ghost i want to focus primarily on mediumship today that is communicating with the spirits of the deceased, communicating with ghosts. And then we can talk a bit about ghost hunting at the end, using some of the knowledge that we've learned. Um, so um, what we're asking is whether there is evidence that the soul, which is your mind, your consciousness, however you want to slice it up, survives death on the one hand, and on the other can then communicate with the living. So let's have a look at this. How did this get started? Well, as mentioned, people have been believing in ghosts for forever, for, for, for a long, long time, since, at, like, since antiquity and probably, probably into prehistory. I would be very surprised if, if a prehistorical humans did not believe in ghosts and spirits. 
but at least the modern version, the contemporary version, started like this. Started in 1848 with the Fox sisters, Kate and Margareta. They lived in New York, in Hydesville, New York. And they reported hearing these me mediumistic raps coming from the end of their bed. A rap in this context means like a knocking sound, like a tap, tap, tap. Not like, um, you know, somebody spitting fresh rhymes or anything like that at the end of their bed. And they, they worked out a code, sort of code with, with what they thought was a spirit communicating with them, which went two taps for yes and one for no. And they claimed that they could communicate with the spirit of a dead man who'd been buried underneath their house using these taps. Word spread, and people came from far and wide to see these sisters communicate with the dead. Um, it's not clear from Blackmore's description whether the sisters were communicating or claiming to communicate solely with this dead man, or whether they claimed to be able to receive messages from other dead spirits. I would like to look into that a little bit further. And I think I probably will because I have a secret project that I want to start working on. Okay, it's not a secret. Actually, I, uh, I want to start working on a book for this class. Um, my own book that I could use. And I think I, I want to do a deep dive into this story for that project. Um. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, you know, it would be it would be like uh, like a philosophy book, but accessible, you know, um, something you could use for a textbook, but also maybe something that you could give to your friend who likes philosophy or something. Right. So anyway, I'm years away from this. <laughs> so don't get too excited. But yeah. Well, thanks. Well, just by being in this class, you guys are helping because um, that helps me develop all these ideas. Right. So. Yeah, just by being here, that's a good thing for me. Um, so word spreads far and wide, and they give public demonstrations. Uh, yeah, you're spoiler alert, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're getting demonstrations, public demonstrations, where they're, I guess they're bringing their bed around with them and doing the seances from the bed as if it if it's like it's some kind of magic bed that allows you to communicate with the with the dead what's that old movie uh bed knobs and broomsticks why am i thinking of that wasn't there a magic bed in that movie i don't know it's been so long that's a really old weird movie right it's like one of those live action slash animated movies from the i don't even know when when it was from Yeah, it's an old one. It's an old one. I think I saw it. I, I saw it when I was a child. Um, I you know now now I have to check. Is it from your generation? Am I am I am I getting this wrong? Am I having like a Mandela effect moment? Let me check. I'm I'm gonna Google this. Oh, never mind. It's from 1970. Uh -huh. Yes. Sorry. Yes. 1971. Aha. Uh -huh. I thought this was way newer than 71. Yeah. But you know what? I totally misremembered who was in it. So Angela Lansbury. Uh, I thought. I thought it was. Um. Um, what's her name? Julie Andrews. I thought it was Julie Andrews, but but then look here. In uh, apparently they had trouble getting the rights for the film because of its similarity to Mary Poppins, which of course stars Julie Andrews. So weird how your brain mixes stuff up, isn't it? Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of like that, I imagine. Hey, maybe the story was even inspired by the Fox sisters. I don't know. But anyway, there's a magic bed and they can fly around and do things on their magic bed. Um, so the Fox sisters confessed to being frauds in 1888. 
a lot of people had been skeptical. More people were believers in the fox's ability, but in um, but they but they confessed to fraudulent uh, activity in the late nineteen uh, or sorry in the late eighteen eighties, and they show they even showed people how they produced the wraps, which was basically by cracking their toe joints against the the posts in the bed. Right, uh, Taylor, go ahead. Yeah, um, in the reading, I was just about to say like how they how they did it, but I was kind of bummed that like why did they confess? Like if everything was going so great, like the reading didn't really say why they decided to confess after all these years, like just so that they could say that they pulled the wool over everyone's eyes. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I I guess yeah, Isaac in the chat says it could be because they felt guilty. Um they there was a period in their lives i think after their initial success where they where they went through some financial trouble and i think they were both they both um they both were uh were were dealing with alcoholism as well um so their lives were maybe a bit turbulent and thought uh, if we come forward um maybe that'll be good i i really don't know again I would like it. I I really would like to do a deep dive into this. Um, they were they did retract that confession, but the skeptics thought, well, if you've confessed or been caught, uh, we're we're just going to assume that you're still uh, fooling us, trying to fool us, right? You're still a fraud. Um, if you're like, no, no, when I confessed, I was a fraud that was false well oh uh you, you see what i mean right yeah yeah it's weird it's weird to it's it's a weird thing to to confess and then retract um <clears throat> uh, but you know what it almost didn't even matter um because those who believe kept believing um this this story was the start of the spiritualist craze of the 19th century and eventually it spread across the pond to great britain and then uh because of the interest of serious scientists and philosophers the society of psychical research began um so this was the spark the the the, the uh the fox sisters were the sort of spark that that ignited this craze and of course, the spiritualist craze gave rise to psychical research and the, the Society for Psychical Research, which eventually gave way to parapsychology, which eventually, um, you know, leads, leads to now. Uh, so pretty cool. Pretty cool. A little history here for you all. <clears throat> so uh, let's go on. So by the very end of the 19th century, spiritualism was uh, all the rage um yeah yeah it's a big full circle moment right everybody um it's great like okay so so check this out um it, by the end of the 19th century um i'd say that was the height of this craze and there were spirit mediums working all over the place in europe and in north america especially the united states but i imagine there were some here in canada as well and and certainly there were um, certainly there were spiritual practices going on in uh, Latin America, uh, which are which are probably quite probably developed quite uh, differently than spiritualism did in the English speaking parts of America. Uh, so that is also something that it would be really cool to do a deep dive on. And if some of you are looking for papers like ideas for your papers. Uh, that might be an interesting comparison, the comparison um, between spiritualism uh, spirit or spirit comparison of spiritualism um, within and between, you know, uh, English speaking countries and Spanish speaking countries. Uh, and, you know, um, there's all kinds of things here you can write about. It would be amazing. Uh, but anyway, these spirit mediums. Uh, would hold seances, right? And you've all heard of a seance. Typically, you sit around a table or around in a circle on the floor. And of the kind of seances that we're concerned with, which are called table-turning seances, people would place their hands on the table, and then the table would start to move. 
And that would uh, be evidence, it is claimed, that the spirit or the ghost is trying to make contact. And of course, these seances are taking place in uh, what used to be called parlors. Nowadays, we don't really have parlors. We have living rooms. Uh, and I'll come back to this in a minute because this is actually really interesting. But um, you're in the parlor, round table. Um, the room is dark. People would report hearing voices or perhaps feeling a breeze or a touch on the back of their neck. They would see objects being moved without being touched. Um, and some mediums would even ooze this ectoplasm, uh, a gooey, gray, translucent substance, which they said was from the spirit world. So a few interesting things to note here. One is, uh, this is why to this day, uh, wait, hang on, let's see what's in the chat. Um, oh, the ectoplasm. Yeah, ghost goop. Well, you know, like Ghostbusters, when the ghosts uh, slime you, that's, you know, ectoplasm. Uh, I, I, I'm going to tell you all about living rooms and parlors. Yeah, in a moment. Um, first, I wanted to say, uh, so all of this, the 19th century spiritualist craze is one of the reason why uh, we still associate um, like Victorian Edwardian architecture with haunted houses, right? Um, and as far as living rooms and parlors go, well, it used to be back, back, back in the day that, um, we'll, we'll go back to the chat. Well, we're going to go to, we, we're, we're going to actually wrap up by talking about Ouija boards. Yeah. So, so, so hang in there. We will, we will be discussing those. Um, so, uh, parlors used to be living rooms. It's where you would hang out. Like, think about it. This is before radio, before television. So you have a parlor in your house, which comes from the French parlay, which means to speak. So it's a room where people would hang out and talk. Um, and when uh, back back in the day, when you had a relative who passed away, um, the funeral would typically be uh, held in your home. Yeah, you could drink. You could have a you could have a symposium in your parlor if you wanted to absolutely um so when when a loved one died the funeral would often be held in the parlor at one's home um but that changed with the advent of the funeral home uh the sort of death industry um they rebranded parlors as living rooms. You don't want a dead body in your living room, do you? Well, come on over to Johnny's funeral home or whatever, right? You have your funeral here. Keep that dead body out of your house. Um, that is why we call them living rooms now, um, because of the funeral home industry. Yeah, I agree. The death industry would make it might already be a bad name, but if it's not, I should steal it. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Alicia. I call. Uh, did, did did what in Turkey? What did they do? I'm just not sure what what we're referring to. Oh, burn the dead underneath their house. Oh, wow. Oh, interesting. Oh, buried. Oh, okay. Jeez. How did they burn them under the house? Did they have like a a little furnace under there? Wow, yeah. No, buried makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it kind of makes sense depending on what you think of the afterlife and the soul. You might, if, if you believe that you know, if you're part of a culture that believes that the spirits of the dead stay here, then yeah, you probably want to keep your relatives close. You want to bury them maybe under your house or in the family plot or somewhere close by. You know, and think about this in, in, in like a, a lot of in indigenous communities and cultures, there's like a, sort of like ancestor worship. Same thing with uh, uh, like... Um, 
I think it's a big thing in Confucianism, uh, in the Shinto religion, right? Ancestors are important. So keep them close, right? But if you believe that um, uh, when you die, you go to heaven, then it's no big deal. You can put, we can put your body in the cemetery because you're actually up in heaven. Uh, or maybe you're in hell. I don't know. Uh, the point is, is that the soul is somewhere else. It's not around where I am. So maybe we don't need to keep the body so close either. You know, and nowadays a lot of Christians and uh, and people like that who believe in heaven, um, you know, they 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 go in for cremation, which is actually pretty new. Um, you know, Christians used to be kind of a rule that you didn't do that because the body needed to be intact so that it could be reanimated when Jesus comes back. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a new thing. Um, uh, cremation was kind of a pagan thing. You know, that was for Greeks and Romans and Vikings and all those guys. Okay, so back to seances. Uh, one spirit, uh, example of a spirit medium was Eusapia Palladino. She would do things like apparently levitate herself. She could levitate other objects in her immediate vicinity. Uh, she would materialize extra limbs. She could move furniture with her mind. Uh, but in 1895, she was caught cheating. Now, even after she was caught cheating, some, uh, like William Crooks, some members of the uh, Psychical Research Society, still maintained uh, that she could perform real acts of mediumship and psychokinesis. Um, Daniel Dunglass Hume was a medium who... Uh, nobody ever really caught cheating, and he actually worked in well lit rooms rather than dimly, uh, uh, dim rooms or dark rooms. And people said of Hume that he could handle hot coals and suffer no burns, he could materialize extra limbs, he could move objects with his mind, he could even levitate himself, apparently. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, like, uh, I, I don't, I don't get it. Spider-Man. Um, oh, like eight limbs. Oh, oh, like a literal Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you meant like Spider-Man, the comic book character. <laughs> um, okay. Um, these mediums, um, had many tools at their disposal. In fact, the same tools as parlor magicians. That's right. There was a type of magic practiced at this time, which basically involved doing the exact same things the mediums were doing, materializing limbs, levitating objects, uh, as well as other things like uh, card tricks, close-up mat, close-up like sleight of hand. And it was called parlor magic because it's, it's in between stage magic and close-up magic. Close-up magic is like your David Blaine kind of like, you know, you've got your cards and there's maybe one other person you're like, watch, and you do your trick, right? Uh, stage magic obviously takes place on a stage for a big audience. So you, you, that's, your, that's your Chris Angel, David Copperfield stuff. Um, parlor magic is in between. Um, and, it was, and it was like a big, uh, a big thing back then. So, you know, there were like uh, big, big drapes, trumpets, uh, spirit writing slates, glow-in-the-dark paint that music, uh, magicians and the psychic mediums would use um, to create their effects. Now, we don't know the exact extent to which spirit mediums from the 19th century took advantage of these things, but it's probably, I suspect it's all of them. Um, and, and many of them were caught cheating using the exact same tools and techniques that parlor magicians use all the time, right? I mean, magicians are doing, uh, even, even modern day magicians, like mentalists, for example, are doing things that make it seem like they have psychic powers or that they can communicate with the dead, but they won't tell you that that's what they're doing. It's just a trick. It's just an illusion or, or an effect. I think some magicians get mad if you call them tricks, right? Anybody ever see Arrested Development?
maybe not. But there's the the character Job is um is a magician and he doesn't like it when you call them tricks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Will Arnett's character. He's funny. Um so uh well more well. <laughs> Oh, I should rewatch that show. It's such a stupid show. I mean, it's stupid. It's not stupid. It's a smart show, but it's but it's all about really stupid people. <laughs> um. So, um. Okay. Um. A skeptic like me would say that if I catch you cheating, you know, because the magicians are not telling us they have magic powers; they're doing illusions. And they're open about that. But um, if it's a psychic medium we're talking about and I catch them cheating, I'm just going to assume that they've been cheating every time. Right? It's like athletes who use steroids. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. it. I mean, it's if you guys haven't seen it, it it it's really great. It's a great satirical kind of poking fun at dumb dumb wealthy people. If you like that sort of thing, it's just a very it's a very very clever show. Um, yeah, there and a lot of a lot of really quotable moments. Um, so anyway, um. It's like, okay, so cheating, mediums, mediums cheating is like, it reminds me of athletes using steroids. Um, now, some athletes uh, use steroids, and that's fine. Um, I know that, like, for example, in, um, and this is probably not the best example, uh, but there's, like, open categories um, in, like, bodybuilding where you can you can be the open category is for the people who take the steroids and then there's like the the natural category where you don't right so maybe there's some but then again that's not really a, a sport it's 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 a it's it's a, it is a performance but it's not it's not exactly like other sports it's for the so people take these steroids for aesthetics not for performance, right? Uh, but still, there are charlatans. Um, you know, there are, there, first of all, there are cheaters, right? There are people who take steroids on the reg in, in sports events that they are not supposed to, um, which confers an advantage, which, which is cheating, right? Like I'm talking about your Lance Armstrongs, right? Um, so there's that. And then there's the straight up con artists. Uh, like I think recently there was this guy. He, he was calling himself the liver king. And he was just eating all the organ meats, all the raw organ meats and living like uh, how, how I think he thinks cavemen lived or something. Uh, claiming like, oh, if you follow all of my ancestral tenets, you can become ripped and bulked up like me of course the dude was on all of the steroids right he was it blew up um yeah he's a fraud he was a fraud um once somebody like that is caught you're done like we know the jig is up right um same with psychics if if i catch you cheating um that's it scooby-doo moment we when we pull the mask off of the villain right yeah he was taking yeah he was taking so much was that his real name brian johnson yeah oh for real oh i i didn't know that i just i just yeah what a what a i mean like i like you don't have to <sighs> Like, if you're going to do that, just be like, yeah, I take steroids. This is why I look the way I do. Because otherwise you're going to have people spending their money. Well, he did it to rip people off because he sold 
like he was selling stuff to people, right? Um, that's why he did it. Yeah, and it's disappointing. Like, and there are fitness influencers that are like, Yeah, I'm on steroids. Don't don't not be on steroids and expect to look like me. And I think that's probably okay. I mean, there are health concerns with taking steroids, um, but but it, I, I just don't think you should lie to people, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, eat raw liver and you can look like me. And it's like, no, no, that's not going to happen. You know, if you if you have infinite steroid money, then that'll happen. And even then, um, it, you know, it depends on genetics and it depends on diet and it depends on... It, it, it's not just like you take steroids and all of a sudden you're the incredible hulk right um so yeah 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 many a lot of people i mean oh yeah there's definitely still many more liver kings out there it's just that he's he was kind of the um extreme example you know what i mean um yeah yeah, that's right. Um, that's true. That's true. Like you're, um, I'm trying to think of somebody. See, I don't really know sports, but, um, but, but, but over COVID, um, uh, watching strongman competitions was actually one of my like COVID boredom cures. So I started getting, getting, getting to know of a few of the people. And I know that there are guys like, um, like your, you know, your, uh, your, your Larry wheels is right. Who are like, yeah, I take steroids. Um, so, um, you know, at least the, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Eddie Hall must, I've never, I've never heard him admit to be on steroids, but the dude must have been on steroids. I mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe you can confirm that or not, but yeah, Eddie Hall, I mean, strong, they're all, all the strong men are on steroids. For those who don't know. Yeah. Eddie Hall is a, is one of those strong men. Yeah. Ronnie Coleman, who was a bodybuilder. He was like Mr. Universe a, a few times. Yeah. He, he, he talked about it. WWE again, because although there is an athletic component in the WWE, it, it, it is um, the way they look, the, the, they look the way they do for aesthetic reasons, not for athletic reasons. Like they, they want to be all roided out because it looks impressive in the ring, not because they need to look like that to do the wrestling. Right. Although it does help to be in really good shape if you're going to be a wrestler. Right. But yeah, I wouldn't do that. I, I don't want to look like that, but I could probably stand to go out and move around a little bit more. Yeah. The wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. I should have used my air quotes, but yeah, they're all, they're all doing it, which is kind of why strong man is interesting um, or strength athletics, because of course there are also competitions for uh, women. Um, um, uh, so, so um you know, with strength athletics, uh, it's kind of just like, okay, take all the steroids and see what you can do. <laughs> like how many times can you lift this car or can you pull the airplane or whatever? Right. So it's kind of like, yeah, that is what it is. But if it in, in other sports, no. Okay. Very roundabout way of saying that, you know, if somebody's trying to sell you something, you should be wary. And if a, if a medium has been caught, a psychic has been caught. You need to be wary. Um, and for some reason, you know, like when people are faced with like the news about, you know, oh, Liver King's a fraud, right? People abandon him. There are probably still some hangers on. But with psychics, it doesn't seem to be that way. Somebody can get busted um, and, and, and uh, they'll just carry on like the Fox sisters and people will still believe it. Um, crazy it's really crazy so there's lots of um tools at the time right tools that parlor magicians could use to enhance their performances back in the 19th century um and speaking of enhancement i mean i did i did have this point on the next slide that i wanted to raise with you i mean well but we we, we kind of already talked about it I mean, 
would you say that even the best mediums might need to enhance their abilities from time to time? I mean, I wouldn't buy that argument coming from an athlete. Right? Like, it's not like Liver King was like, oh, I'm totally ripped from the nine ancestral tenants. Um, uh, but sometimes I just need a little steroids. No, it was like, lots of steroids like every single steroid so yeah that there's that um yeah practice the sleight of hand if you're uh if you're if you yeah there's no magic pill for being a magician that's 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 the thing but yeah i wouldn't accept this when it came to sports like performance in sports or performance in school um <clears throat> yeah when you have a chance, you should watch this video. Um, unfortunately, I can't share it live the way we're streaming here. Um, but this is um, a demonstration of a technique called hot reading. Uh, a hot reading, by the way, is gathering information before a reading and then using that knowledge to create the illusion of having psychic powers. Cold reading is when you're gathering information while you're doing the reading. And then you use that information to create the illusion of your magical or psychic powers. Now, this video is of Peter Popoff, who was not a medium. He was a faith healer, um, but uh, he was busted by James Randi, the amazing Randi. Um, cheating. What he would do is... Um, See, apparently pick out people in the audience that would come to his healings and he'd know their names he'd know what was wrong with them like he'd know their health problems and then he would do what is called the laying on of hands you know um you'll see this in evangelical churches where people put their hands on on each other and he'll do this the idea is to heal or exercise a demon or to heal the sick I mean, he's basically claiming to be performing miracles, right? Um, so how is he picking people out with their names and what's wrong with them? How does he know? Well, before the show, people fill out prayer cards, little cards where they say who they are, what their illness is, what they would like God to heal. Popoff's wife is relaying this information via a wireless earpiece to Peter Popoff. And he was busted in the 80s, and he's still around. Now he sells, like, magic water. But, um, but yeah, he was based, that was hot reading. Like, prayer cards, his wife beams it using his uh, earpiece. Um, that is, that is as, as hot as hot reading gets, right? Um, and cold reading would be like if I were doing a reading with you, and I said, um, I'm getting a... Uh, I'm getting a, a a presence. It's uh it's it's first name begins with M. M. Is it an M? And you go, oh, my uncle Marty. I'm like, yes, Marty says hello. But I didn't tell you. Oh, Uncle Marty's calling. No, you told me that your uncle's name was Marty. I was just fishing for information. It could have been anyone. It could have been your Aunt Mabel. It could have been your mom. It could have been um your buddy Mumford, right? Anybody with a name, right? Uh, that starts with M. Um, yeah, magic water. It's supposed to be water, water that like is blessed and heals you. Some like like Peter Popoff's special holy water. That is what um, he is selling now. Don't buy it. It's just regular water. Yeah, you can get regular water for, for free uh, all over the place. So yeah. Don't buy, don't buy the magic water. So, I mean, and so, some are going to say like, look, this doesn't mean that all mediums are cheating. But I think that there are good reasons to suspect that all mediums are cheating. I mean, um, let's see, where are we? Because I want to... I want to talk about Tyler Henry. I'll just talk about Tyler Henry now. Who knows about Tyler Henry? 
while you answer in the chat, I will go top up my coffee. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got uh, lots of coffee. There's coffee aplenty. Nope. <laughs> I love you, darling. Okay. <laughs> Hi, guys. Yeah, Sydney, that's right. Yeah, Hollywood Psychic. Yeah, with the Kardashians. He does all of the celebrities. I can't friggin' believe the nerve of this guy, to be frank. Um, he claims he doesn't use Google. First of all, who doesn't use Google? I mean, or if you don't use Google, you've got another favorite search engine. Maybe you use Bing or something. He says, I don't use Google. He only does readings for celebrities. And he is of the demographic where, you know, he says, he says to his audience, oh, I don't follow celebrities. And I don't buy it. Like, what? The guy is exactly the certain, the, the, that age uh, uh, where, where, you know, he would know about all of the celebrities he, he talks with. You know, he's younger than me. I, like, what am I? I'm a millennial. So Tyler Henry is, is um, what's, what are you guys? I can't keep track. Wait, of, you're... Yeah, like Tyler Henry is a little younger than me. So, okay, Gen Z. Yeah, Gen Z is what I'm looking for. So Tyler Henry is Gen Z. And he knows all the celebrities a, a Gen Z person would know, right? Um, yeah, I guess Zillennials are kind of on the border. I don't know. I don't know. Not a sociologist. But but anyway, I, I just don't believe that he doesn't know about celebrities and doesn't use Google because he's of a demographic that knows about celebrities and definitely uses google you know yeah okay yeah so 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 yeah gen z and then and then then there's another one i don't know mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> ipad kids <laughs> yeah I was raised by a computer. Um, okay. Um, just if you don't believe me, just check out Tyler Henry if you haven't seen or or any any um, um, Long Island Medium. I don't know her name. I used to, but she's from Long Island, and she has that Long Island. You know, she has that accent from long island and she does the readings what's her name oh teresa yeah teresa caputo that's her name teresa caputo from long island um you can see it it's straight up cold reading um fishing for information uh and then getting the information oh no oh i i did not i'm not a fan personally speaking but if you like that sort of thing i mean by the way like i'm not if you're if you watch this stuff for entertainment i'm not trying to i'm not trying to harsh your buzz or anything i i'm just saying that um i don't think that there is good evidence for the claim that they are actually communicating with dead people um yeah uh, lots of other examples of psychics. Um, I remember back in my day, it was John Edward. It was James Van Prague. It was Sylvia Brown. Oh, she was like, if, you know, okay, maybe you believe in mediums, maybe you don't. But Sylvia Brown was a predator. I mean, she would gaslight people, straight up gaslight people. You know, people looking for their lost children. Oh, your child is dead. Then the child just turns up alive. 
Um, like, oh, she was awful. And I, I can't, I can't with that kind of stuff. That's just wrong. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And there's another, this wasn't um, Sylvia Brown, but there's this really old clip from Inside Edition uh, of, uh, I'll find it, I'll find it for you all. Um, but it's this reporter who's uh, asking about you know, this little girl. Oh, here's this picture of this little girl. She was kidnapped when she was a child and she's missing. And can you tell us what happened? And of course, the psychic says, well, oh, sh I'm sorry, but she's dead. And then big reveal. Uh, no, that it's just a picture of the reporter when she was a child. She's like, no, this is me and I'm alive right here in front of you. So, you know, fail. Um, you know, it is what it is. Okay, let's get back to um, this. You know, some people uh, don't realize just how, um, I guess, um, where's that from? I don't, I don't, I'm not following that. Certainly interesting. Oh, 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 you mean on the clip I was referring to? I see, yeah. Yeah, there's kind of that moment when whenever you catch a fraud, when they're like, hmm, what do I do here? Um, yeah, it's a it's an old viral clip. Yeah, it's from like the early days of YouTube, that clip. It's one of the first like ones that went viral on YouTube. Um, yeah, um, yeah, interference. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, secondhand embarrassment. Yeah, like cringe. Yeah, a lot of these psychic fails are a little cringe. Um, yeah, exactly. It's the electronics from the cameras interfering with reception. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what I was going to say is that I think that most people are not, are just not aware of, of, um, of of uh of the possibility of breakdowns of the senses and this is something that yench mentions in his paper on the uncanny uh and freud kind of talks about it too but when your senses break down you see things that aren't there these could be illusions hallucinations just mistakes you know in a dark room where you're having a seance uh that's the perfect spot for this to happen because you're in a dark room and we're visual creatures and we need it to be bright so that we can see right so there's really no surprise there and um here we have a, a skeptical parapsychologist kind of like blackmore his name is richard wiseman and he has actually created these fake seances he's got an actor who comes in and uh moves the table and claims it's levitating when actually the table hasn't moved he paints objects around the room with glow-in-the-dark paint and then there's a, a covert guy in the background, like a ninja, with a pokey stick moving the objects. And the participants that come in and do the seance, remember, there's a plant or a confederate, the actor, about uh, who's, who's kind of like, oh, the table's moving, wow. And about one third of the participants agree with him and report the same, even though we know the table did not move. And of the people that reported that the table moved, more were believers in the paranormal. There were more believers in the paranormal than there were people who did not believe in the paranormal. Um, I have to say, um, if we're going back in time for a little bit here, it's not as if every Victorian or Edwardian scientist believed in spiritualism. Um, but some did take it seriously and not just scientists, actually. Um, so if I, what, what does the name Arthur Conan Doyle mean to all of you? Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Bookman. Yes. Uh, Conrad Sherlock Holmes. Exactly. That's what I was looking for. And what does the name Sherlock Holmes mean to all of you? 
or the character? What do we associate? It doesn't have to be Conan Doyle's version. It could be, you know, in the eighties, he was played uh, by Jeremy Brett. Um, more recently, Benedict Cumberbatch, right? But they all get the character pretty much right. Yeah, funky detective, poor Watson, smart man, rational to the extreme, right? Um, rational to the extreme. Um, <laughs> I kind of liked it, but I did see problems with it. The problem is how they depict is how is how people depict smart people. Like, oh, I've got to go to my mind palace. <laughs> Yeah, just gonna pop up to the mind palace real quick. Hang on. If you haven't seen it, that's a thing that happens in the show. <laughs> but I just thought I just thought it was silly. Yeah, um I mean, I suppose I don't see that I don't see that they're not that all of the mysteries are not well explained. I mean, I think what I think that I think uh, where the, where the where the Conan Doyle stories tell um, the show shows, um, and it's a tricky it's a tricky thing to strike a balance with, right? Like I remember um, again, like the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes from the eighties um, uh, were pretty much right from the stories, um, so it was just exactly the same, um, at least. Uh, Sherlock tries to do a little bit of um, a little bit something new, but I think I, I, Sherlock is too extreme almost, you know, like, like the character's just not believable would be, would be my complaint. Right. But I still have fun watching it. Um, so um, bu -bu -bum. let's go for a few more minutes and then take a break. Um, so, uh, what I was saying is that, sh uh, Conan Doyle, um, I, which I don't know that word, um, but yeah, it starts with an E. I'm going to have to go look this up. I have my um I have my copy. It's got all of them. Um I'm just going to just going to come back to that later. Uh th my point is um that Conan Doyle who creates this like super logical rational character like Sherlock Holmes was a spiritualist. He was he believed in mediums and he uh he was actually convinced by the Coddington fairy hoax, which was a photography hoax where a photographer claimed to have evidence for fairies. I, he had taken pictures of fairies. Of course, they weren't real fairies. They were just tiny little dolls uh, that he had taken pictures of close up to make them look like they were life-size people. Um, and Conan Doyle thought these were real fairies, right? really well it's not a netflix show is it it's a um it's um it's channel four or no it's bbc too warm um i don't know um oh that one oh i thought you were talking about the Sh sherlock show yeah no enola holmes was interesting yeah you're you know you're right uh yeah where henry cavill is playing sherlock holmes um uh i got that impression too i was like he's way too nice <laughs> to be holmes you know like he he like gives a g gives a he gives um he cares about he cares about someone? What? That's not Sherlock Holmes. What? <laughs> I, 
I mean, he does a good job. Um, but yeah, um, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't realize there was a lawsuit there. I think, though, um, I think Sherlock Holmes is actually now, as of this year, I think he's in the public domain, though. So guess what? We can all write our, we can all get our Sherlock Holmes fan fiction published or whatever. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have any of that, but. Yeah, I don't know. I thought it was this year. Um... Oh, interesting. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay. I gotcha. Right, yes, it does have a quite a different meaning today, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the mental imagery. <laughs> Oh man, okay. <laughs> All right. Um okay, we got to get back on track. So another scientist, William Crooks, who I've talked about, the chemist, right? Um uh he claimed that he had taken photographs of spirits. And um uh, and he was reeled in by spirit photographers too, right? And this is a guy who, uh, um, you know, made important contributions to spectroscopy and who, um, and who, uh, I believe he also discovered an element. Uh, I forget which one. I want to say cadmium. Maybe somebody can check that for me. But anyway, he uh, may have been very uh, impacted by the death of his younger brother, his younger brother, uh, Philip, right? Uh, he was only 21 years old when he died. Uh, Philip was only 21, that is. Um, it was later that year, the year he died, 1867, where he would go to a seance and try and contact the spirit of his little brother. Um, he was also convinced that... Um, Hume's powers were uh, were real, and like the other psychical researchers of the time, um, thought that perhaps this represented a new sort of energy or, or a new set of abilities that that just had not been explained by science yet. Blackmore thinks that actually this this was uh, reflective of an, a sort of antagonism toward materialism, however. Oh, thallium. Okay, good. Yeah, completely different element. Thank you, Tabitha. Yeah. Um, oh no, I can't. Oh, I gotta stay away from the chat. I just keep see I just keep seeing it. Um I completely forgot about that. I don't think, you know, I don't think I've read a Sherlock Holmes story since my undergrad days i should go and i should dust it off and read some um yeah blackmore thinks that actually the motivation um for crooks is a sort of antagonism toward materialism physicalism and and it's not hard to see why i mean physics in the 19th century was amazing physics was solving problems left and right we've we were in the 19th century we were figuring out how electricity works we had already had newton and his laws of motion and the physics was 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 blowing up it was actually kind of spinning its wheels for a little bit uh until albert einstein came along and figured out something new But this physics of the 19th century was very materialistic and it did not leave room for um, ghosts, spirits, God, free will, an afterlife. Just think here of Laplace's demon, a thought experiment um, from Pierre de Laplace. Um, Laplace thought that everything in the universe was material. 
uh, when asked by Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon asked him why, about his book. Hey, Laplace, why, why don't you talk about God in your physics book? And Laplace replied, I have no need of that hypothesis, sir. So it's materialism. Everything is matter in motion, and we can explain all of, all of that with the laws of nature. So we don't need God. Um, Darwin. Darwin, around the same time, um, end of the 19th century, publishes the theory of evolution. God, uh, God did not create humans as they are now. Rather, humans evolved from lower life forms. We're not special, right? We're not special anymore. Darwin did, again, what Copernicus and Galileo and Newton had done before. At the at the at, during the scientific revolution, we used to think that the Earth was at the center of the cosmos and the sun went around the Earth. But Copernicus, Kepler, Brahe, Galileo, Newton, all helped show that that was not the case and could not be the case. Rather, the sun is what the Earth goes around. We go around the sun. So we're not special anymore. Same with Darwin. We're not special. We just come from apes. What you've heard, you've heard this quote from Friedrich Nietzsche, probably God is dead and we have killed him. Has anyone heard that? It's, it's probably Nietzsche's most famous quote, right? So you've probably heard of it. So what does it mean? God is dead and we have killed him. Does that mean that there was a God and we, we literally killed it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, basically, James, I would say that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. But also, because, because of science, um, even if you wanted to, it's impossible to believe. Nietzsche says, if you are actually like operating in good faith, there's no way you can believe anymore uh, with what we know about the universe. You can choose to yeah. Yeah. Um, you're all you're all right. Um, there are many reasons. Um, one is, uh, you know, um, like I was saying, it's just not a real possible. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a really a a, a possible horizon of meaning anymore. Given what we know about the world, it's just. And if you really, if you are really acting in good faith. You, there's no way you can believe both. You can't have science and the natural world and religion at the same time. You can't, Nietzsche would say. If you decide to do that, you're one of uh, what he calls the last men. Instead, what you need to do is become the ubermensch, the, uh, the superior human. And that means you have to decide what matters to you. You have to reevaluate all of your values and make your own meaning in life right and i like that i like that um spiritualism comes along you know we've got we've got you know the scientific revolution we got laplace we've got darwin we've got nietzsche uh, even freud freud is another one freud is another one like ah oh, belief in god now we're just all like we've just repressed all of our primitive animistic tendencies you know so freud freud was another one like man is not the rational animal what are you talking about the mind is divided and you don't know about most of what's going on in it you know so all of a sudden humans aren't special we're not at the center of creation we're not made by god in his image we're not even rational animals anymore but along comes spiritualism. Hey, don't worry, humans. Uh, there is life after death, and you do have a soul, and we don't have to be materialists anymore. So really, you know, there's a heck of an argument to be made that this is why this had such an appeal and why it continues to have such an appeal, because we live in a world that runs on science and advanced technology. Like I said last time, we live on... 
we live in such a world and the worry is almost almost none of us know how it all works which is a problem but it may also be the reason why people are still gravitating towards spiritual sorts of uh, belief spiritualism it gets us out of the mundane right it it sure does whether whether it's true or not it does get us out of the mundane um but around this time we had another skeptic michael faraday michael faraday was a popularizer of science a science educator and a scientist um you know, later in this class, we'll be watching an episode of Carl Sagan's Cosmos, which is a classic series. But there's a new version of Cosmos that Neil deGrasse Tyson did. I think it may still be on Netflix, in fact. And uh, he's got an episode on Faraday, which is pretty good. Um, so I recommend checking that out if you have access to it. So Faraday, he was a skeptic of these spiritualists skeptic of the psychic mediums but he realized what the implications for science would have been if it turned out that these things were real so he had to investigate and before we see how he investigated it let's pause for um a break let's come back at 1 15 okay and then we will continue talking about mediumship and spiritualism and we'll get to talk about the luigi board all right, so stay tuned.
All right. Okay. Let's get back to it. So this is a seance. This is the kind of thing that uh, Faraday wanted to um, investigate. A table turning seance like the one I mentioned before. So this, the, the medium would sit, uh, I think this is the medium, just by the makeup there. Uh, this is our medium um, leading the seance where everyone has their hands on the table and the table would move. And uh, this is supposed to be the um, evidence of a spirit attempting to communicate uh, with the people who are holding the seance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, Conrad. It is true. Um, now, um, Faraday thought something was up. So he invented these cards. Uh, well, he didn't invent them. He made, made a type of card that he could attach to the table using a sort of cement. And he placed these cards under people's hands when their hands were placed upon the table. And by examining how the cement was smeared on the cards, he could tell whether the table had moved first or whether their hands had moved first. So if it's a ghost moving the table, obviously the table should move first, right? But what Faraday found when he examined the patterns in his cement on the cards was that, in, uh, the, 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 was, was that the hands were moving first before the table. What seemed to be happening was that the individuals were moving the table unconsciously without knowing that they were moving the table. And this is called the ideomotor effect. And you, you may have heard of it. The ideomotor effect is at play uh, in table turning seances, uh, in dowsing, and um, the Ouija board, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Supernatural phenomena like this, um, well, like Ouija boards, are still um, espoused by um, by spiritualist individuals, despite the fact that we've known about the ideomotor effect for a very long time, right? So here is the Luigi board. I'm just kidding. It's the Ouija board. I hope you all had a chance to see that. Thank you to whoever shared that. I forgot. I just remembered the funny pronunciations. I forgot all the weird questions like, how do you burn Luigi board? How do you burn oeg board like people needed to get rid of them as if they were cursed i mean the, these are made by toy companies so they're not they're not cursed they're just fine they're toys but it's a popular way of um attempting to contact spirits and like i said last time uh the name comes from we oui in french and yes in, uh, and ya in german so yes yes it's the yes yes board so you'll never misspell it again uh, yeah. Right? Like, like, do I have to have... I can't use the knockoff? Like, what? I mean, come on. The idea here is that um, we're communicating. We're basically holding a seance when we use a Ouija board. And everybody puts their hands on this. This is called the planchette. And it moves across the board. It can go yes, no, spell out a name or something, pick some numbers, or say goodbye. Are we really talking to spirits when we use the Ouija board? Well, probably not. Probably what's going on is the idiomotor effect. How did we work this out? Let's consider a case, um, a case of something called precognitive arousal. This is uh, from William Gray Walter, who was uh, working as a neuroscientist in the middle of the 20th century. Um, yeah, why does there have to be two people? I'll tell you why. Because you can't get the idiomotor effect without two people or more. <laughs> um, so, okay. So William Gray Walter was a neuroscientist or a neurologist rather. And he had patients that had to come in for surgery, for brain surgery. And sometimes he would ask them if they wanted to participate in an experiment. Uh, and this particular experiment was uh, involving precognitive arousal. 
So these patients, again, who had to have brain surgery anyway, um, otherwise we couldn't do an experiment like this, um, had electrodes implanted in their motor cortex, which could uh, detect the signals from the motor cortex. And they were sat in front of a projector um, pushing the button uh, for a slide projector. Uh, they had to push the button uh, when, um, when they felt the need to change the slide, they pushed the button and the slide changes. But the slides are not changing with the button presses. The slides are changing by detecting activity in the motor cortex, the activity involved in getting you to do this, to push the button. That's detected and amplified by our little implant, which startled a lot of the patients. They said um, just before they were about to push the button, the slide changed on its own, right? So this is really cool because this illustrates an example of uh, a set of conditions where we are in control, but we don't know or feel that we are. Because of course, you're in control in the sense that it signals from your brain causing the slides to change, but it's not your conscious pressing of the button. It's the neural signal that the electrode is detecting. So we can be in control of situations without feeling or knowing that we are. That's what the ideomotor effect is all about. And Gray Walter could have experimented with longer or shorter times such that maybe participants had no, there was no difference so that the, uh, the neural signal changes the slide at the same time the button is pressed, but the button isn't connected to anything. And then people would not have felt that strange sensation, right? It can probably happen the other way around too. Um, this is an argument offered by Daniel Wegner, um, who was a psychologist at Harvard University who specialized in free will. That was his claim to fame. So what Wegner asks is, is it possible for our brains to create the feeling that we've caused an action, even if we haven't? So the opposite of Gray Walter, where Gray Walter's patients um, caused an action, but didn't feel like they had caused it. Here, we're talking about feeling like we've caused an action when we haven't. And in fact, Wegner thinks that this is how free, our, our experience of free will works. It's an illusion, he says. It's the mind's best trick. So Wegner proposes the following. He says that um, we experience free will. We have the feeling that we are the cause of our actions. But that's an illusion that's created in three steps. The first step is the brain plans actions and prepares to carry them out. This is basically what gray walters electrodes were picking up and amplifying in the previous example then we become consciously aware of performing the action that's the conscious intention the action um the action of course follows the intention so we plan an action consciously form the intention carry out the the action which follows the intention and if they occur close enough together in time, what we do is we conclude that our intention caused the action. But of course, our unconscious planning of the action is what really sets the causal chain going. Um, so there are three requirements, Wegner says, to have an experience of willing. The thought has to occur before the action, that is the intention. Uh, it's got to be consistent with the action. And it must not be accompanied by other causes. So to have the feeling of free will, those conditions need to obtain. So um, I have a conscious intention to pick up my coffee cup. I pick up my coffee cup. Feels like I did that because they incur, they, they, they happened so close together, the intention and the action. But my motor plan, my unconscious planning to pick up the coffee cup actually was the first thing to happen. Does that mean we don't have free will? Mm, I don't know. We better stay away from that one. 
Um, so Daniel Wagner and Talia Wheatley wanted to um, explore this possibility. So they used an experiment that was pretty much like a kind of Ouija board setup. But instead of a flat board with a planchette, here we have um, a 20 meter, a 20 centimeter square board mounted on a computer mouse. And the mouse moved on a computer screen. And the screen contained 50 small objects, different kinds of objects. The number of people tested in the study was 51, 51 undergraduate psychology students. Now, unbeknownst to these psychology students, they were paired with an experimental confederate, somebody who was in on it. We're going to call the participant Dan. There were like 51, but let's say they're all Dan. Um, and then the confederate is Jane. That's what Blackmore does. So Dan and Jane sit facing one another and they have their hands on the 20 centimeter square cursor board, which is on the mouse, uh, on a mouse. <clears throat> they had to move the mouse around so that the cursor would point at one of the objects on the screen. And they had to stop every 30 seconds and rate how strong their intention was to make the stop. So they're just kind of doing this like a Ouija board, every 30 seconds, um, they, they have to stop and rate how strong their intention was to stop. Now, during the trial, they were playing words through headphones. Words which corresponded to the objects on the screen. The signal for them to stop was music being played for 10 seconds. Now, Dan thinks that Jane is receiving different words in her headphones. So Dan might be hearing like car, swan, tree, cat. And he thinks that Jane is hearing a different set of words. But Jane is in on it. She's just hearing instructions about how she ought to move the uh, cursor board. There were four different trials. Jane would be told to stop on an object, say a swan, while Dan is hearing the music. Now, Dan, in, in, his, in his headphones, could hear the word swan either 30 seconds before stopping, five seconds before stopping, one second before stopping, or one second after stopping. And remember, it's Jane stopping and, uh, and Dan just kind of going with it. In other trials, there were no forced stops. Now, all the participants, so all of our Dan's, gave the highest agreement ratings for the statement, I intended to make the stop when the word came one seconds or five seconds before the stop, when the, when the word matched what they stopped on, right? So if, I, if, if Jane is going to get me to stop on swan and I hear the word swan 30 seconds before that happens, then I don't really have the uh, feeling that I intended to make that stop. But if I hear the word swan five seconds or one second before the stop and then Jane stops, I feel like I intended to stop there, even though I'm just doing this and Jane is the one moving the cursor. Do you see what I mean? This is called the priority principle. Ex effects are experienced as willed, as caused by us when the relevant thoughts occur just before the events. So this is a tricky one, right? Like it, it, there's a lot going on in this experiment and it, it's kind of hard sometimes to use your imagination to keep track of it all. So does anyone have any questions about this? Everybody follow how the experiment worked. You may want to read over the slides a second time. You may want to read over the this portion of the textbook a few times because, you know, you, it's, it's a lot of information there. But as long as there are no questions, I think we can continue. Oh. <sighs> Excuse me. Okay, so I suppose there are no questions. So that's good. So what their experiment here shows is that it's possible for experiences of willing something to occur can happen even when you, even when you haven't exercised any voluntary choice. And this is kind of Wegner's whole point about free will. 
is that we don't really have it, but we feel like we do. Um, that that's that's Wegner's uh, kind of claim to fame. In fact, um, we feel like we have free will, but we actually do not. What whether you think we have free will or not, um, perhaps this can also explain why some people believe that they can influence events with their minds. Right, the power of of thinking, the power of consciousness, the omnipotence of thought, magical thinking, all of that. Why do people believe they can influence events? Well, maybe they've had an experience where they're, uh, maybe you're at the sports game, right? And you're cheering on your team with everybody else and you're, everyone's cheering so hard and then they score a goal and it feels like because the cheering and the goal happened within close enough proximity, it feels like you helped cause that to happen. And if you have enough experiences like that, you might think that you could affect the world with your thoughts, right? Um, all right, does free will really not exist, though? What do we think? Yeah, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> You're right. Um, Wegner th thinks that we do not have free will. Um, Blackmore is kind of agnostic about it. Uh, Conrad, that's a good point. It does depend on how we define free will. Um, that, that could be a causal link, but I'm talking about somebody's, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the sensation that you've willed the team to score a goal, Right. Yeah, and not from your living room. I mean, people watch Wheel of Fortune in their living room and they shout, big money, big money, maybe, right? Uh, I don't know, but um, we got some hands up. Taylor and then James. Hey, um, yeah, so I think that it exists, but I think that it exists with consequence. Um, and mm. so when I was reading the article, I was thinking about like um, the free will to like get out of bed and, and go to work you don't want to go to work right but the consequences of that is you know not having any money or home or and mm. so i think free will free choice exists um but i think that there are always consequences to that choice that are out of our control yeah i would say um i would say that's one way to cash it out for sure um you're you're not like um you're not like completely free and that you can do whatever you want right um but you're free enough such that you can be held responsible for your actions right so like sure you're free you could not go to work um but then you might get fired right so um and that's how we can that's how we hold people morally responsible like why we praise people who do good things and and punish people who do bad things because their agents that we assume they are the cause of those actions that we evaluate as good or bad so we kind of need there to be moral responsibility or free will for there to be moral responsibility and i think your example taylor uh kind of highlights that um yeah the stoics are interesting because they're like um why worry about what you don't have control over um they were good stoicism is pretty good uh, just make sure you're ac reading actual Stoic philosophy and not those Stoic tech bros on the internet. Th those guys are terrible. Uh, they get it all wrong. Uh, James, go ahead. Um, I don't believe in free will. I'm more of a determinist kind of person. Um, okay. So like Laplace. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think just the complexity of the human mind um makes the determinism seem like free will but like for example everybody has like a favorite type of milk right everybody you either like like one percent maybe like two percent maybe like almond milk if you were to program a robot with all of your experiences and then send it to the supermarket it would buy your favorite milk and yeah i i think most people agree that robots don't have free will so where does that get its idea from? And that would be determinism, right? 
your yeah. past experiences determine your future yeah. outcomes. Yeah. Now, now, so that's, that's, um, I mean, and there's different varieties of, of determinism, right. Uh, which I think is, um, most, um, uh, like, uh, worth emphasizing here, there's hard determinism where I'm just determined, I'm determined physically, like I'm determined by the laws of physics, I'm determined biologically, I'm determined by my upbringing, um, I am who I am because of everything that's out of my control. And I really don't have any free will because I'm like a robot zombie thing that thinks he has free will, but doesn't. That's hard determinism, but there's also compatibilism. And I'm, I, I just happen to be a compatibilist. Um, compatibilism is uh, the idea that free will is in fact compatible with the deterministic universe. And uh, what they mean when they say that is that you are always free to have done otherwise. Um, that means that sure, a lot of my, a lot of what it is to be me is determined by physics, by biology, by whatever. Um, but I'm free in the sense that I'm not being forced or, or coerced by other agents. I'm free in that sense. James, go ahead. So, yeah, you're definitely free to, like, change your mind. But in a given in circumstance, if you're like, oh, maybe today I'm going to try something else, that seems like free will. But maybe it was just an a, accumulation of, like, restlessness and you needed to try, try something new. Yeah. So, like, it could have been determined that you wanted to try something different. Yeah. But maybe what I try is, is I choose what I try. Do I play a, a new video game? Do I learn a new song? What do I do? But are you really choosing if you don't know every option? I'm choosing in the sense that matters to a compatibilist because nobody is pointing a gun at my head and saying, you can't learn a new song. You have to play the new video game instead, right? Uh, yeah, but what if like the most optimal video game to play was made 30 years ago, but you can't choose to play it? You know, like you can only choose from well, the we don't, we don't, available. this doesn't have to be about actualities. This can also yeah. be about disposition. So if I knew about, you know, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, Pong is the best video game, but I don't know about it. Um, but if I knew about Pong, would I be disposed to choose to play that over something else? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it's, it's tricky with counterfactual reasoning, right? But, um, but I, I'm just saying that the universe is determined for sure on compatibilism. But I, uh, I am free in, in the ways that matter to other agents. I, I can do things uncoerced and I can be held responsible for the consequences of my actions. That's the sense in which I'm free, right? But I'm not free in the sense that I can just like decide not to drink water ever again like oh i don't like water anymore i'm not going to drink it well then i'll die right so <laughs> you know what i mean um so yeah the universe is still deterministic but i do think that there is some some freedom there uh let me address the comments and then i will uh, say a thing about what i really think um yeah conrad where it's more fatalism like yeah that's what laplace's demon is about which i didn't really explain um that's like super hard determinism where imagine um you um have um the supernatural demon guy or or like a godlike being that knew all of the initial conditions of the universe and all the laws of physics well then it could predict what we're doing here at the beginning of the universe could predict what we're doing here like 13 and a half billion years later that's laplace's demon that's like hard determinism so yeah that's very fatalistic um and yeah isaac maybe the things that happened to me that week or that day determine what i'm more or less likely to do but um those are probably those are just probabilities um so yeah that's okay i'm okay with that um Maybe, maybe, maybe we can allow for the demon to have free will. Maybe we don't. It doesn't really matter for the purposes of, of the thought experiment, right? 
But yeah, fatalism, don't be a fatalist. If you're a determinist, don't be a fatalist. Um, you can be a determinist and still believe in free will. That's what compatibilism is. Um, the psychologist Richard Gregory has a great way of putting it. Um, we do have free, we don't have free will, but we do have free won't. Even the processes in my brain that I think are, you know, I think I'm reaching out to pick up this cup and I decided to do that, but the motor plans kicked into gear before my conscious intention to pick up the cup became conscious. So, and this has been demonstrated scientifically, like when we're talking about simple actions at any rate, the unconscious, um, what we call readiness potential in the motor cortex always happens before the conscious intention to perform the action. But we can elect not to perform the action. And we see that the readiness potential spikes and then goes away. And people don't report a conscious intention to move. They said, actually, I, I, was, I felt the urge, but then I decided not to. So that's what Richard Gregory means when he says we don't have free will, but we do have free won't. And that's very compatibilist as well. Um, so anyway, a quick look at ghost hunting. You'll want to watch this video. Um, I, I have not put it on the Discord channel, but I will. I'll, 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 uh, or, or maybe I won't. I mean, you do have the slides. You can just you can just click on the link in the slides if you want. But it's about two people going ghost hunting. Um, you can watch it and uh, see what you think. Um, it's, yeah, it's typical ghost hunting, right? Going into a place at night, looking with infrared cameras, recording noises with your EMF or electromagnetic field meters. I mean, but it sounds like most of you have seen some kind of ghost hunting show before. So I don't know. Why don't we just riff on ghost hunting for a little bit before we go talk about ghost hunting? What do you guys think about those shows where they hunt ghosts? I I'll kick it. I'll kick it off. Do you think that they're going to find anything or that there's uh, or that, um, you know, there are some ghosts there that they could detect with their instruments? Um phasmophobia i don't know that game uh but yeah if it's scary i might have to give it a go um johnny says it's entertainment and yeah i think that's probably the healthiest way to consume this sort of thing what about you taylor um so i i'm not a huge fan of ghost hunters like i do find it like a little bit elementary um and sometimes like when they're explaining things i'm not picking up like what they are um in terms of like you know hearing the same things or like seeing the same things and a lot of the times the music in the background is like if you took the music out of the background um you would find that like a lot of the noises and like stuff like that it I don't know it kind of seems like it's uh you know it's an effect yeah. right um yeah but yeah totally it, like, destination fear is really good um this is a group of like this is like four kids like my age like late 20s who um travel around to prisons um in the states and hospitals and like different areas and they um split up alone um and sleep there um and the experience is like really terrifying because like there's not a lot of music in the background like they're very much just like making themselves be really scared and um like a Blair Witch kind of atmosphere yeah and it, yeah. Is, it is really freaky and it's hard for me to like not take it seriously because that is one of my biggest fears I don't like the dark I don't like ghosts like it just freaks me out so I credit that show with like bringing a little bit more substance to the ghost hunting world. Um, yeah, fair enough. I mean, um, and, and I think if you want it, I mean, personally speaking, I think it, it's probably fine to consume that for entertainment. Um, my, my, my main issue is when these shows claim to be doing science, you know, and th that's what myths me. 
uh, because I am a scientist, <laughs> you know, and um, I, okay, so there's, oh, it looks like there's a lot of new ghost hunting shows that I don't know of. Kindred Spirits, this one, uh, the one Taylor was discussing. So there's a lot of stuff out there, right? Um, and some of it's probably, like, arguably, I'm sure it's better produced, uh, easier to take uh, seriously. Personally, I mean, you know, you you hear that there's this old trope in, in fiction where... Um, was it here yeah no yeah yeah exactly like oh yeah and 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 yeah like that's that's one thing i should mention is um like ghost hunters they go in and kind of play at being scientists but it sounds like this other show um destination fear was it called um it sounds like that show it they're not trying to be scientists they're just going to a scary location it's almost like I guess it's kind of a dark tourism thing. Although I would have to ask Dr. Becker about that if we get our guest lecture. Um, I've got to remember to email him and uh, try to work this out. Um, I, I'll hopefully get some updates for you soon. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, it's just when they pretend to be scientists that bugs me. But here's a question. If ghosts are not physical, what are we doing with recording recording sounds and using EMF meters and trying to take pictures of orbs if ghosts are not physical? What are we what are we doing there? Why are we doing that? Right? Yeah. Like ghosts are what? Supposed to be the disembodied spirits of deceased people? Okay, it's non-physical. I'll use my EMF meter, though, which detects electric fields, which are physical. So, like, what's going on? Like, you, you, they got to get their story straight. Ghosts are physical or they're not. Which is it? Yeah. Yeah, Carol, that's right. Like, it, it's this is why it's pseudoscience, right? Because they're going in there with um, tools that look like something a scientist might use, but they're the wrong tools for the job. I mean, and we know uh, that um, there are camera artifacts. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Most people don't act, don't use EMF meters and infrared cameras in their day to day life. They don't. So, oh, oh an EMF meter. Like, let me get the EMF meter. Like that, right? It's like um, other people might think of that as like. Uh, some kind of scientific scanning device like your tricorder from star trek which you know just scans anything anything and everything and just boop, oh it's uh, this thing my tricorder told me so right but an ef me an ef an emf meter is not that yeah like they could use a geiger counter and maybe the geiger counter would click a lot because somebody left a banana out or something and and but nobody would uh, but but most people won't understand what what a geyer counter is for right well typically when they say non-physical i mean i i mean non-physical as in like immaterial substance like substance dualism non-physical when people yeah but people do make this uh conf they do they do mix this up uh, a lot of people talk about ghosts as if they are energy right like ghosts is the ghosts are the mental energy of a person that's not that's not a thing like um that's not how energy works right um so so you're just they're just using a physical term to refer to something non-physical again energy is physical right like electricity Electricity is energy, and it's a it's a physical process governed by physical laws. Um, so that's what scientists mean when they say physical versus non-physical. But a lot of people have a folk notion of physicality, which is, but that interferes with the thinking about this, and that's why it's so it's so cloudy and confused. Like, oh, the ghost is a is is a supernatural or a paranormal entity. But I can use my EMF meter to detect uh, electricity from the ghost. I mean, no, that's not how it works. Um, 
and we know that there are camera artifacts. Like if you're taking a picture, you can sometimes take a picture of what looks like a ghost or an orb or some weird freaky stuff. And it's not because you've actually taken a picture of something. It's an artifact of the process of taking a picture. Maybe you left your shutter open too long. Um, this happened to me once. It was re really sad, actually. It was a friend of the family who was sick with cancer. And she believed in the afterlife and the other side and did tarot cards. And it was a comfort for her. And I was like, okay, cool. I get it. But she shows me this one picture she had taken of, uh, of herself by the Christmas tree. And all of the lights in the Christmas tree were like long, like they had trails emanating from them. And there was another person, a ghostly person beside her. She's like, look, it's a ghost. I've got evidence of the ghost. And I was just like, you've used the wrong camera settings. Like that's just a, an accidental long exposure. That's all that is. And I thought, this is just sad. Yeah, it was an overexposure. And I thought, that well, this is really sad that this is... I wouldn't want to cling to that. I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to cling to that as evidence of an afterlife. Um, I don't know. It sucks. It really sucks. But dying sucks, right? Death sucks. <laughs> I mean, yeah. No two ways about it. The stone, the stone tape. Uh, what, what, Tabitha? What a stone tape? Am I? Am I? Is have I, have I got that right? I don't know this. Oh, nice. So it happened to Emma. Uh, that's interesting. Okay, Tabitha, here, here we go. The speculation that ghosts and hauntings are analogous to tape recordings and that mental impressions during emotional or traumatic events can be projected in the form of energy or recorded. Uh huh. I mean, I suppose that doesn't make sense to a physicalist, though. Yeah, I mean, that might be what the ghost hunters think. Yeah, but that's not um, what a naturalist, either metaphysical or methodological, would say. Um, again, because that's not really, that's not energy, right? Um, again, I mean, maybe people are applying their folk dualism to their understanding of energy. So it's a folk notion of energy. Um, what about when we record the noises and we hear somebody like, get out, leave, you know, like you always hear like a ghost speaking in like a heavy metal voice on these tapes, or do you? What could be going on there? We talked about it last time. Yeah. Oh, you've got it pretty close. It's a tricky word to spell, but yeah, it's pareidolia, uh, where we, you know, see faces in, in random visual stimuli, or we hear voices in random noise. That's pareidolia. And it's because the brain is always on the lookout for stuff, especially if that stuff is to do with other people, because we're social beings. It's crazy to think just how much of this comes out of our evolutionary past. This evolutionary baggage that we have not divested. Sure, we have science and technology now, but we still have a Stone Age brain, if you think about it. And we still sometimes slip into these ways of looking at the world like our prehistoric ancestors did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could argue it's a form of determinism. But does that mean the skeptics have a little more free will? 
they've overcome their their determined stone age brain that the brain that's determined to believe in ghosts and spirits we've overcome it with skepticism does that mean i have a little free will or am i exercising my free won't in in in, in so far as i'm i won't believe in that uh animistic sort of view of the world right <laughs> yeah it could be it maybe it's in my genes right <clears throat> so um so yeah what do you guys think of that i don't see alicia's determined to believe in ghosts but james and i may be determined to be skeptical who knows and yeah being taught is a is a way of being determined like think about how people grow up um with the beliefs that they have Unless they uh, take a philosophy class uh, or read a philosophy book and start questioning things, um, people tend to stick with what they know, right? Um, and that's why... Um, what about when people claim to see a lady with a dress? Where does the mind go and let the matter go? Because why would we still... Well, um, I mean, people may, people, people can be mistaken about what they see. Um, right. Um, this has happened to me. Um, uh, for example, I was outside, uh, when I was in grad school, I lived in residence, uh, in Leeds house, but I used to, uh, go outside cause I, I was a smoker back then. I was smoking those real cigarettes. Um, stupidest thing i've ever done by the way is take up smoking um so you know not all skeptics are like super smart big brain people uh we we do dumb shit too <laughs> um so i'm outside having a smoke um <clears throat> yeah 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 james is a good example um I, I get this out of the corner of my eye. I see somebody staring at me from up high in on the fifth floor out of a window. And I'm like, don't turn around. Don't turn around. Or they'll know you're that they'll see. They'll know that you saw them and, blah, and it'll be a weird. It'll be weird, man. Eventually I turned around and it's not a person at all. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a plant in a vase, right? That I just misperceived. Uh, on my peripheral vision, right? So we can misperceive things all the time. Yeah. Yeah, Catholic, I mean, I mean, uh, no no shade or anything, but Catholicism is is uh, strange to me. And I, I I need to qualify this by saying like I was not raised religiously. And uh and uh oh okay okay good yeah i didn't want to i mean like i don't know who's still religious and who's not um i, I don't want to step on anybody's toes but like i uh but but the reason why we have these beliefs like some of the determinists in the class have been saying is perhaps just because we were taught them and if you still have them it may be because you just have not had occasion to critically examine them for a lot of religious people, I think this happens in university, really. Like you, 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 you have your set of beliefs, you have a worldview. It could be a religious one or it could just be a spiritual one. It, it doesn't matter. But then you get to university and that's when you start to learn like, okay, there's more out there. I need to sort of think about this all a little bit more. And that's kind of cool, actually. <laughs> good one, Conrad, good one uh because of demons oh yeah see that always sounded strange to me i'm like what are we talking about it's a game uh yeah i know i know taylor i know isn't that weird like the body you know the eucharist like that's jesus is that's supposed to be jesus's blood yeah interesting <laughs> sydney go ahead yeah, I was just wondering, so you said like when people go to universities, if they have like that determinist mindset, then they get it like expanded to other potential ideas that conflict with their existing beliefs. Is that why you have things like BYUs and um, 
You mean Brigham <laughs> Young University? Yes. Yeah. So like yeah. it's it's taught within the like all the information shared is taught within the confines of the existing belief. So you don't go against your predetermined the predetermined notions. Yeah, I think I think you're exactly right about that. I think that's why there are such institutions. I mean, um, like the term uh, safe space gets used a lot nowadays, you know, a space where you're safe from uh, prejudice or bullying or harm. And these are safe spaces for for that sort of worldview. If you're a Mormon, you can go to Brigham Young University, get a university degree, but you're not going to learn anything that's going to make you question the tenets of your faith. You could be an evangelical Christian and go to Liberty University and you're not going to learn about the theory of evolution or anything like that that's going to quest, quest, make you question your evangelical beliefs. Yeah. Um, are those places real universities? I'm going to say no. Um, sure, they have the buildings and the maybe they have the accreditation. But that's not what university is supposed to be. University is supposed to challenge you. Um, and, and in a safe way. Like I tell people this class is a safe space because I want you to challenge your own beliefs. I don't want to make fun of you if you believe something different than the next person. But this is university. You are supposed to test your beliefs. That's how we grow, right? Yeah, if you have an education that does not challenge, yeah, absolutely. You're all absolutely correct, you know. And good for you guys, you know, if you're if you're religious or believe in stuff and you're in this class and you're sticking with it, good for you. You know, um you're doing what university is here for for you to for you to do with it. Um determinism though. Um I yeah, I don't get it. Uh, not not determinism, but religion. And maybe you can chalk this up to determinism, but I was never raised religiously. And I think that you kind of have to be, to be religious. I know that there are converts, right? There are people that join another religion or join, become religious. Uh, like Cat Stevens, right? You guys know Cat Stevens? I guess not. um yes yes maria that's right a wild world yeah 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 uh um not i don't think so not that song but that is like a a cat steven song yeah james i i do agree with what you say there uh, but yeah, Wild World is uh, Cat Stevens. Cat Stevens, uh, for a long time, went by the name of uh, Yusuf Islam because he had this near-death experience where he was swimming. And um, he got caught in like a, a riptide, like an undertow, and he nearly drowned. And as he was drowning, he like said a prayer. He was like, if, if God, if you can save me, I will work for you, God. And he survived. And did a little reading, tr kind of tried out all the major major religions. And he eventually settled on uh, Islam and changed his name to Yusuf Islam, which means in English, uh, Joseph Islam, right? Because uh, he liked the name Joseph from the Bible, I suppose. Um, Islam, of course, means submission or surrender, right? Um, now... There are experiences like that. There are people who have those, those, those experiences. But I think that most people need to be raised religious in order to be religious. And there are a few experiences that I've had that make me think this. One, and this is one of my earliest kind of philosophical moments, was I remember I was in elementary school. I think I was probably in the fifth or sixth grade. And we had moved from southern Ontario around about an hour outside of Toronto up up north to kind of like the North Bay Sudbury area when I was down south my mom was always trying to get me into after school programs because I just wouldn't socialize um 
so I did like the beavers, the Cub Scouts and those things hated it. Uh, but the but the parents made me do it because of the social skills. Uh, didn't it didn't work. Um, <laughs> it did not work. But anyway, when we moved up north, they, they were like, we got to tr- keep the kids in, in something. So we'll join the we'll we'll sign up to the boys, the boy girl club, the boys and girls club, which I thought was just like a, you know, a Cub Scouts girl guide thing for boys and girls at the same time. It wasn't gendered like the Scouts and the and the like Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts or whatever. Right. But I slowly realized that this was a religious um, thing. I don't think my parents knew that when they signed me up for it, they didn't know it was like a religious thing, but it was like a Christian um, after school scout thing where you could earn badges and stuff. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was weird. Like it was weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least this was, this was, it was uh, the, the guy who ran it. I don't know if the club was religious Uh, like the whole thing but the guy who ran this one was a pentecostal pastor pastor bob i still remember he was a he was a good guy like i mean i've i went with him and i would volunteer in the soup kitchen in sudbury and that was fun pastor bob also ran the chess club that's how i learned to play chess uh or how i learned properly i should say so you know pastor bob was a solid dude but um uh, you know, he's like your cool pastor with a, with a guitar and he'll sing songs, right? Like a cool pastor. But one day we're doing, and this is how I realized it was religious, is, is that we're, we're all given a copy of the New Testament and, and we started talking about the soul of all things and, and uh, how um, humans have souls, but animals don't. So only people go to heaven and so on and so forth. And, and I remember I was, it was like one of my first philosophical moments where I was like, but hang on, animals surely, uh, surely think and, and, and perceive and act. And, you know, I wasn't thinking about it in this terminology, but I was like, well, if the soul is, is what allows me to see and do things and have thoughts and animals clearly have that too maybe to a lesser extent so how is it that they don't have a soul that doesn't make any sense to me you know um uh and it was just weird and after that i had to i was like you know what this is uh, not for me they're not it's not this doesn't make any sense to me um and the praying people would pray and it was it was like this is i mean if, if you're raised that way you get it if you're not you don't get it right? Similarly, um, what was the other example? Oh, I had another one. There was the Pastor Bob example. Oh, it was church. I have a friend in North Bay when I was there for college who was, uh, we got along great. Um, Yeah, I'd say it's weird if you're the only one not doing it. (laughs) <laughs> you know you feel weird you're like i'm not i'm just standing here um but yeah it's it's weird i'm talking but but the, you know yeah i'm talking about the way christians pray which is like asking god for for stuff um jews muslims they pray differently right so th- theirs is more of like a ritualistic prayer right rather than a talking to god sort of prayer or like writing in your diary yeah like like taylor says yeah so i'm i'm talking specifically about christianity i realize that um, prayer in islam for example is a way different kind of thing than prayer in catholicism uh or in judaism right but um but the point i want to make is that uh it's it's kind of foreign if you've not been raised that way Uh, Okay, so what was that example I was going to give? Um, Right, church. My friend Laura from North Bay, who is a Christian, and we got along great, even though she was a Christian and I'm an atheist. And she says, hey, you know, you can come to church with me and see what it's like if you want to. And I thought, what the hell? I'll give it a try. So I go there and um, I mean, it wasn't what I was expecting. It was about 20 minutes of devotional music from like the church band like you know your worship band 
five, 10 minute sermon, another 15, 20 minutes of music. And that was it. I was like, oh, I thought there would be a longer sermon or something. No, it was mostly music. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? Like, <laughs> so I said to the priest, what the hell? I'll give it a try. No. <laughs> um, oh, Alicia, that must have been weird. Oh, weird. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. I think you should be allowed to be comfortable if you're going to a religious place to worship. Yeah, exactly. They were singing like Jeremiah the Bullfrog. Actually, no, I don't think they sang that one. But they sung, it was just, you know, your typical like, you know, um, he is risen type stuff, right? Oh, what's, what's the name of that person who does, who does that song? I used to know her name. But anyway, I felt so freaking weird when I went to this church. Um, I don't know that one. I, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm as bad at devotional music as I am at religious practice. Like, I don't know. The only one I know is uh, Modest Yahoo. You guys know Modest Yahoo? <laughs> He does like rap ska kind of stuff. He's got some, he spits some funky fresh rhymes. Um, huh, interesting. Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed is definitely a folkloristic kind of song. Because Johnny Appleseed is, a, is, he's from American folklore, isn't he, right? He, he planted all the apple trees. So it's, I, I don't know if it's religious, but it's, it's certainly folkloristic. Uh, but then again, maybe the apple seeds are supposed to symbolize faith. I don't know. Um, again, not, not religious, so I don't know. Um, but, but my point is, th going to church as an atheist who had never been, uh, oh, he was a missionary. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. That makes sense. That makes sense. I don't know about Johnny. A well, that's another thing. Johnny Appleseed is more of an American uh, thing. Um, I don't really know a, a lot of Americana, a lot of American folklore. I know a little bit, but not, not a whole lot. So, um, yeah. So, okay. So, uh, experience number two, it was the weirdest thing. The weirdest thing. Not that, not that the people were weird. It was weird for me because everybody knew all of the lyrics to the songs. Everyone was singing. Everyone had their hands in the air like they just didn't care. And I was stand there. Oh, and their eyes were closed. Like, everyone. And I was just standing there like, like this. And I don't think I can ever go into a church again. It just feels really, really weird. It's just, it's just foreign. It's utterly foreign to me, right? Because I didn't grow up with it. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's just so weird. I don't mind watching other people. I think it's interesting watching other people do it. Almost like a, I put my anthropologist hat on, right? Like I, um, I used to work at a Tim Hortons um, during grad school and during undergrad as well. But in grad school, I worked at this one. Um, um, just about, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't mind watching it. Like, okay, so this is my example, right? Um, I, I worked at this Tim Hortons. It, it used to be uh, right uh, on, right down on King Edward Avenue here in downtown Ottawa, right by the homeless shelter. It was a rough place. Um, not really the best place to work, but the customers were cool. Uh, actually, actually, a lot of the clients at the homeless shelter were my regulars and I developed quite a nice rapport with them and they were very nice. And uh, it was the management that I didn't like. Um, but anyway, a lot of my coworkers were Muslim 
Uh, and they still are. They're not my coworkers, but they're, they're still Muslim, of course. Um, so they have to pray five times a day. And so sometimes they have to pray at work. Um, and, and I'm from Northern Ontario. I don't know any, any, the only religious people I know are like Catholics, right? Because it's all, it's, it's mostly French Catholics up there. And so, so I'm like, oh, interesting. Uh, you have to go pray? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll hold the fort. And then I, afterward, you know, I can kind of watch like, oh, okay. So it's like, you know, you say some things and you do the rituals and, and then I, so like when you're praying, what are you doing there? Like, and I learned something and like put my anthropologist hat on and I'm like, that's cool. That's what I want to do. Right. I want to understand why people are religious and what it means to them and what they do or why people believe in the paranormal and what it means to them and so on and so forth. But I don't really want that for myself. If, if that makes sense, you see what I mean? That's why I try not to be like one of those Reddit atheists who's like, like, riddle me this, could God make a stone so heavy even he couldn't lift it? Well, if he can, then he can't lift it and he's not omnipotent. And if he can't, he's still not omnipotent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, relativism in a certain sense, right? Relativism in terms of meaning, not in terms of the truth. I still believe that science and philosophy are the best means we have of getting to the truth and that there is the truth in that the world is some way and we can figure out what it's like to a certain extent. But relativism, when it comes to meaning, I'm a little more okay with, right? Um, I, oh, good question. Um, um yeah. <laughs> well, I used to be one of those jerk, uh, you know, a little bit of a jerk with the atheism. Uh, but luckily, I didn't go too far down that rabbit hole. Instead, I went and, you know, studied actual philosophy. Uh, Taylor, yes, a lot of people do this. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, the American paleontologist, described uh, religion and science as non overlapping magisteria. So as Galileo said, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So sure, if you want to use religion as a guide for finding meaning in life or living a good life, I think that can probably work for you. Um, oh, I had the fedora too. Yeah, that, this was totally like right around my fedora period. Although I'm not going to lie, it was a good fedora. It, I kind of miss it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Isaac, that sounds cool. Yeah, yeah, the Bible is, Bible is interesting. Um, but, but, but my point is, is that science is supposed to be, again, you can be a methodological naturalist and use science to study the natural world and then go to church or synagogue or mosque on your holy day. And there is no problem with that. In fact, um, I think more religious people ought to get into science. Uh, Julian Offre de la Matrie said in his book, Man and Machine, that if you've got the choice, if you want to know how the world works and you've got the choice between scripture and nature, you have to go with nature. Because who made nature? God is supposed to have made nature. So you've got to, be, you've got to go and look at the natural world if you want to understand God. I can, I'm not religious, but again, that gels with me a lot more than a lot of other stuff does. Uh, Sydney, go ahead. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. The leader of, like, the old leader of the Green Party was religious. Yep. Because one time, yeah, it, she accidentally slipped up saying, like, something about God, and she's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. But, like, her personal beliefs are God, but she also has that science background. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or um, another example is an American scientist named um, Ken Brown. Uh, he was actually an expert witness during the, um, uh, I think it was the Dover District School Board, um, Kitz, Miller, Kitz Miller et al. versus the Dover uh, School Board, which was about uh, introducing intelligent design, that basically creationism, into the science classroom. 
And, and so he was an expert witness because he's an evolutionary biologist and, and a practicing Catholic. And for him, there's no conflict between, you know, um, God created the world and humans evolved from lower animals. It's just the way to him, it's just, that's the way God did it, evolution. And the Bible is an allegory, not a literal story, right? Um, so absolutely, you can, you can totally be a religious and a scientist. And yeah, like Carol says here, Isaac Newton was very religious. And like Christina says, you might think that nature just is God. That would make you a pantheist. God is all. The philosopher Spinoza was a pantheist. Uh, which got him excommunicated from his community. Spinoza was Jewish, uh, but he said God is uh, God is nature. Um, but if God is all, but if God is all, that means I'm God. Uh, that's heresy. So he was excommunicated. Um, yeah, 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 Conrad. Exactly. This this was happening right around the time I was getting into philosophy. So it was very interesting. Um, some of these public discussions were what really got me interested and, and, and uh, led me to where I am now, uh, which is cool. Uh, we better wrap up though. Um, what can we say about mediums and psychics? Well, they can certainly behave dishonestly. Um, I mean, if you could really talk to someone who had died, you would, wouldn't you? If it were possible, I think you would really want to. I mean, it sucks when people die. People we care about die. It really does suck. I mean, fuck. <laughs> it's pardon my language. But there are pet psychics, for goodness sake, because, because people miss their pets so much. You know? I still think about my old cat. You know? Uh, I, I've got a couple great cats here, but oh, I still really miss my old cat sometimes. And... Um, I miss my, my relatives, like my grandparents, you know, I've got one grandparent left now. Um, if I could talk to them again, I, absolutely I would. Yeah, pet psychics are weird since pets don't talk. Yeah, guys, I'm sorry, I don't mean to make you all sad. I'm, I'm really sorry, I don't, I'm getting a little misty-eyed too, to be honest with you. But the prospect of seeing the people you love again is really powerful. Um, and some psychics are maybe have just fooled themselves into thinking they're psychics, but some are predators. Sylvia Brown, Tyler Henry, they have been called grief vampires because they prey on people with missing children, with children who've died, with other relatives who've died. And that makes me angry uh, just as much as thinking about my lost friends and family and pets makes me sad. So it should be, which is why I'm doing this class, right? Um, you know, if you want to sit around and have a seance with your friends and play with a Ouija board, I think that's harmless. But if someone's trying to get money from you to talk to a dead relative, um, that ought to set off some bells in your head, some alarm bells. Besides, you know, if if the souls if souls existed and they survived death, that would be one of the biggest scientific discoveries in history, and it would change our understanding of the entire universe. But there's more simple more parsimonious explanations for what's happening here. The idiomotor effect, the illusion of willing something to happen, uh, our animistic tendencies, our, our paleolithic brains, right? Um, I think this is why the Rhines tried to stay away from claims about life after death, because it is tricky, right? It's a tricky topic. Uh, I do believe that is all. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, you know, Conrad, I think there's something, um, there, there really is, um, 
yeah yeah i see what you're saying like i would rather know the truth the truth is often way more interesting and beautiful than our false beliefs um just take the mind. I mean, the mind is a great example. The, your mind is your soul and the soul is an immaterial entity or your brain, the most complicated object in the known universe somehow is complicated enough that it gives rise to all of your sensations, perceptions, thoughts, everything. That's a way more fascinating answer to me then you have a soul, uh, um, an immaterial soul. You can ha you could have a soul. It, it just might be like a functionalist soul, like Aristotle, right? Anywho, um, we are now past the end of class by a few minutes, so we better wrap up. Really great talk, everyone. Um, I'm going to change the schedule next week slightly. Uh, I think I have uh, astrology first, and then there's anomalistic psychology. We're going to push anomalistic psychology back and next week is going to be all space week. So we're going to do astrology and then we're going to do aliens and UFOs. And for each class, there aren't very many readings. Instead, you're going to watch um, a couple episodes of Cosmos by Carl Sagan, uh, which is always kind of fun. It's an old series. It's, it's older than me, but it's good. You'll understand once you watch it. Okay, thanks everybody. This was a really fun this was a really fun one. Have a great long weekend and I'll see you all next week. And if you have any questions about your assignment, reach out to me, okay? Thanks everyone. Bye.